Sabah Noor, Aina Good Kuntu. morning or good afternoon, wherever you are, uh, honorable assistants. Greetings uh, to everybody, to those who are present with us uh, to participate with us uh, during these webinars on Sudan and the framework of this reimagining the security sector in Sudan. My name is uh, Luca Bunet, and I am the Dean of, uh, of course, uh, ACSS, Africa Center, and Professor of Practice for Security Studies. Uh, I am, of course, I direct the Africa Center's academic programs linking with the Center of Research and Outreach and Alumni Initiatives. I will be the moderator for this session as well. Thank you. Let's kick off this uh, series of webinars uh, that, uh, you know, uh, covers this uh, reimagined the security sector in Sudan. Uh, it will be uh, uh, managed by ACSS and USIP. We will start our program with uh, a short, of course, uh, message from uh, Kate, Kate Knopf from, uh, about the USIP. And uh, Peyton, who is Sayyid Peyton, who uh, is a he's one of the best consultants in uh, USIP, and he will say, Mr. Peyton will start his presentation on the United States uh, uh, Peace, United States Institute of Peace. Mr. Peyton, the floor is yours. Thank you thank very you, much. Thank you, Dr. Luca, and thank you for your leadership in pulling together this excellent uh, discussion this morning, and thank you to our panelists, Dr. Tanner, Timmer. Uh, General Imad, and you know, uh, hopefully we're soon to be joined uh, by uh, Ms. Uh, Mervet uh, Uh This is obviously a very important discussion, and uh, I think as, as everyone knows, the U.S. Institute of Peace uh, is an independent, uh, nonpartisan U.S. government uh, agency, uh, which has long been committed to promoting uh, reform and uh, mitigating uh, conflict uh, in, in the Horn of Africa, and in particular uh, in uh, Sudan. So we're delighted to partner with the Africa Center uh, for Strategic studies on this important uh, series uh, to promote uh, discussion uh, with an emphasis on citizen security uh, in the context, context rather, uh, of Sudan's uh, uh, very important uh, transition. I just want to, to underscore that while both the Africa Center for Strategic Studies and the U.S. Institute of Peace are U.S. Uh, institutions, uh, they are not uh, mechanisms of U.S. policy. So our, our focus here is to provide a platform for Sudanese uh, to discuss these issues uh, of such importance uh, in the context of this transition. And we very much look forward to this discussion and to serving as a resource uh, going forward. So thank you again uh, to the Africa Center and to Dr. Luca in particular, and I look forward to, to the discussion. Uh, uh, Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Payton, for this uh, introduction. We would like to uh, express our greetings one more and uh, greetings to all those who have participated in, to, uh, of course, the uh, the role of the security sector. And before kicking off this meeting, I would like to, uh, to, uh, to uh, of course, give you a little uh, introduction on uh, ACSS, especially for those who have uh, at not attended uh, this uh, these sessions. Uh, the Africa Center for, of course, uh, Africa Center for Strategic Studies uh, is a U.S. Department of State institution uh, established and funded by Congress uh, and for the study and security issues relating to Africa, serving as a forum for bilateral and multilateral research uh, communication. It's, it is an exchange idea involving military and civilian participants. Uh, it is. It has a special, uh, of course, mission, and its it, its uh, mission is to advance security sector by expanding and security understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue and building enduring partnerships. Of course, uh, as I said, the mission is to advance America's sector by expanding understanding and providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building, for example, enduring partnerships and catalyzing strategic solutions. We hope that the series of webinars, uh, especially when we talk about this transit democratic transition of Sudan, will help and will uh, provide you with a, a better understanding of the security sector in Sudan. And I hope it will be the start of a national uh, dialogue to find uh, Sudanese solutions in the security sector so that it can play a better role in the uh, civilian, uh, civilian rule. Before uh, presenting 
of course the speaker the speakers i would like to uh, go back to the first session and uh, especially regarding the role of the security sector first and foremost ladies and gentlemen uh, the uh, experience of tunisia despite its specificity and its difference uh, from the students experience there are some lessons that we can draw and uh, I, I see that there are it's a good experience to learn from first uh, after a period of time uh, there are so many uh, challenges that the Tunisian uh, uh, people have confronted uh, and of course uh, which uh, ensured the transition from authoritarian authoritarian regime to a democratic regime which usually takes uh, a long time second there is the pre the maintain of uh, uh, and of course the insistence of the uh, people's uh, ra uh, conscious raising uh, raising conscious raising and awareness raising and third uh, the trust in the uh, overall sectors and realizing uh, peace and security for the people in order to preserve this uh, the process of transitional democracy number four uh, the civilian and the military rule is very important to talk about uh, the transition towards this elected and civilian uh, uh, government. The Tunisian experience is of extreme importance. There are so many lessons that we can draw from this experience, especially uh, given the coup uh, d'etats that were uh, in, in Sudan. Uh, this uh, The majority of coup d'etats in Sudan, for example, are usually handled with assistance or, of course, from uh, plans from the uh, civilian uh, uh, policy. Second, there is this politicization of uh, uh, civilian rule, especially the security sector and the institutional or military institution. It's which created and was a hurdle to democracy in Sudan, which leads us to uh, think that it's very important to handle the topics pertaining to this very aspect. Number three, uh, isolation or any uh, policy uh, received has uh, created this uh, participation of military. Number four, this uh, the transition on democratic tra uh, transition has uh, uh, pushed uh, the the possibility for creating this uh, transparency uh, and uh, to uh, revisit the uh, military institution role. Uh, Mr. Hassan Al Had and the uh, conclusion he has re he had let he has uh, arrived to. Uh, uh, provided a platform for uh, the uh, role for youth and women, especially in the Sudanese revolution, which uh, leads to the importance of putting in place some youth and women uh, roles and platforms to discuss their importance. Before we kick off this meeting and before we start this discussion, I would like to say that the series of webinars is the second, uh, second of the fifth webinar sessions, and it will uh, bear a special attention uh, of, uh, of uh, taking stock of civilian military relations in Sudan. Uh, this uh, this uh, webinar will uh, talk about the, uh, the reform in the security sector and will bring to light the African experience, uh, which will be held on March, uh, of course, 29th uh, at uh, 12 o'clock Sudanese time. The third webinar will focus as uh, the, the end SS as a specific specific tool, and it will be uh, will be handled on uh, April twelfth. And the last and the fifth will be uh, session will be focused on the national security strategy and the transitional period in uh, Sudan. It will be on April twenty sixth uh, Sudanese time. Uh, it will be uh, online and it will uh, be covered during. 90 minutes it will uh, bear and it will focus uh, some of them will be recorded and they will be moderators and speakers who will uh, provide their presentations after that that will be followed by a question and answer session that will be covered during 30 uh, minutes during the first uh, session we will uh, of course uh, give you the opportunity to ask questions and participants to express, the, to express their questions. The objectives of these uh, webinars uh, are very important. Uh, we are talking about civilian and military uh, relations in Sudan. We will talk also about the challenges in order to foster dialogue and build trust uh, from the security, from the civilian and military rules. We will talk about uh, the necessity to provide understanding to the people and provide military rule. Uh, it will be a great opportunity to, of course, uh, 
uh, to improve the civilian military uh, relations, especially during this transitional phase. Before starting this uh, dialogue, we have to focus on some very important issues. First, as I said, there are two uh, main topics. Uh, there will be a dialogue with the uh, participants and it will be the microphone will be uh, will be uh, offered and so the second uh, uh, session will be uh, uh, questions and answers today I think it will be uh, th there is this non entubushi policy in order to foster quick dialogue and fast uh, understanding between the participants please do not regard decision it's very important uh, we will we we are keen on listening and uh, benefiting from your ideas we ask you not to cite any comment from any participants please so the non attribution policy is very important to take into account during the questions and answer session if you'd like to express a comment or ask a question, we kindly ask you to, um, to uh, express that in the function at Zoom. And when we ask you to uh, express your comment, we ask you to um, activate your microphone. And uh, once you finish your presentation or your question, we ask you to deactivate your uh, questions. The questions will be in both in Arabic and English language. You have the possibility to ask your questions, especially after dialogue, to use the, ch the chat function, especially at the, it's, uh, uh, it's at the bottom of the screen. And if you are uh, needing any technical assistance, we kindly ask you to, again, use the chat and ask your questions. Our staff from, uh, ACS and uh, USIP will make sure to address your questions, uh, of course, uh, through this chat. Uh, today, we will introduce the speakers. I am very pleased to, uh, of course, uh, present three speakers who have wide experience and they have a deep understanding on the Sudanese rule. Uh, it's a team, uh, of course, uh, Ahmed, uh, Ahmed Adin uh, Adwi, he is a Major General Ahmed Dawi, and then we have Tamar Mohammed Abdul Aziz, and we have Mervat Hamad uh, Al Nil. Uh, their bios are provided. I will, uh, I will, but focus on some of their experience. The first speaker, uh, Major. Major General Ahmed al Din Adawi is um, he's the chief of staff of the Sudanese army and he was uh, considered uh, he worked as the commander of Western Military Region and he was a director of the Higher Military Academy and he worked at the general staff of the land forces. Uh, he was uh, he was a, the director of uh, the Islamic political movement. He was the most prominent officer. He is very no knowledgeable uh, about military matters, and he has, uh, of course, the diploma of the diploma of the le major leaders. He is uh, the uh, he worked. He has uh, received a lot of awards and a lot of uh, prizes, especially from the War Defense Institute and from the uh, Supreme Academy. He is uh, a connoisseur. In in, uh, uh, in uh, military matters. He has participated in the peace building process. Uh, he has participated in uh, 2005. Uh, thank you much, Major General Ahmed al din Adawi for participating, for being present in our session. The second uh, speaker is, is, uh, is, is uh, uh, Mervat Hamad al din uh, who is uh, a major who is uh, a political activist. Uh, he began during her time at the university through her work in the field of human rights. And uh, she, uh, is, uh, she is uh, a graduate of the School of Mathematical Sciences at the University of uh, Khartoum. She is uh, she's doing her uh, uh, diploma now and a PhD in uh, gender. And uh, she activates and cause, she is a member of U Pro. She has Sudan programs and workshops uh, also outside of Sudan. Dr. Uh, Tamir Mohammed Abdel Kamin is a lecturer in the Department of uh, Sociology and Social Anthropology at the University of Khadun. Uh, he uh, he's also he received a PhD in anthropology from the University uh, in Germany and uh, am uh, in anthropology and development from Bergen University, Norway. And thank you so much, Mr. Mer Ms. Mervet, uh, Mr. Tamir, and uh, 
of course, uh, Major General Imad al Din al Dawi. We will give the floor first to uh, General Imad al Din al Adawi. The question that I have for you, uh, given your experience in your military career, uh, to your mind, what are the factors that uh, impacted the civilian military relations in Sudan, especially the, uh, given the, the the belief in the military realm, especially uh, given the uh, prominent belief that uh, the, the relations are not good. Thank you very much, General Ahmed. al Dean, please, uh, could you please answer the question? How we have I this very important top topic. It's, uh, it is very important here to uh, talk about and to uh, some uh, theoretical basics and academic basics uh, for uh, understanding to analyze the Sudanese reality, especially in the last periods. Sudan. Um, the uh, nature of the relations, the civilian military relations is worth talking about. And it's, uh, uh, and we see the of course, the, it's very important to see the factors that contributed to look at it as it is. The civilian and military relations are, are, are worth talking about. And we would like to uh, talk also about the issues that uh, prevailed during these uh, civilian military relations. It is very important also as well to uh, go back uh, to some uh, basics uh, uh, that we have considered during, uh, uh, during these, this period of time. Also, we have uh, uh, to look at the military institutions and civilian institutions in, the, in this uh, transition and this democratic transition and the democratic relations and the uh, civilian institutions as well. It is uh, very important as well to look at, this, uh, at these relations. And in order to understand them, we have to focus, uh, of course, the infrastructure of civilian and military institutions and the role it plays and the repercussions of the change that has occurred in Sudan. Uh, it is also very important to uh, see uh, its connection with the components of the uh, Sudanese regime. Is so very important to analyze the political change, which is uh, witnessing a change. And uh, it is also very important to look and to see the interactions in the political uh, arena. Uh, we have to look at the uh, actors in the civilian and military uh, institutions and how these impact uh, on the nature of the change that is occurring in Sudan. Are there any factors that are impacting the civilian and uh, military institutions? Uh, are there any? And uh, let's let's look at them and let's summarize them as follows. Uh, there is this uh, development uh, of, uh, of uh, certain phenomena in Sudan uh, since uh, the old era and uh, uh, the governance was, uh, uh, of course, was mainly focused on army and traditional leaders. We have these uh, spiritual leaders and uh, that were mainly governing. And uh, we have also this uh, relationship between the traditional leaders and the civilian leaders. And this invited uh, uh, several international leaders to look at this phenomenon. The uh, military institution in Sudan uh, have uh, continued to uh, be very specific. It has become uh, dominant and uh, of uh, dominating the, the regime, uh, which is very important to look at. Uh, the, uh, a radical change between uh, the, these phenomena are, are very important to talk about. We have uh, uh, witnessed so many changes in Sudan and we have seen so many tools uh, developing. Uh, and I think it's uh, uh, worth looking at this. Furthermore, during this uh, relation, civilian and military relations, something very important came out and emerged. We have seen uh, during these relations that it was very rare to see change happening between the Sudanese authority and of course the uh, political and uh, gender uh, changes despite the willingness of the military institutions. We have seen uh, several cases during which uh, the military institutions uh, imposed their view and uh, we have not seen this willingness to uh, provide change or see like a national leadership going on. The second uh, factor that we have seen uh, is in this military and uh, uh, civilian institutions is the uh, dominance of uh, these relations. 
we have seen also the theories, uh, some theories emerging, international theories, the, the, the theories, and we have seen also some phenomena prevailing. We have seen theories that are completely different from uh, the uh, existing or prevailing uh, theories in Sudan. Uh, we have seen uh, several countries, uh, for example, uh, witnessing the same uh, uh, situation. These uh, theories and these concepts uh, have, uh, be, have emerged, and that's the lack of uh, synergy between the civilian and military relations. Furthermore, we have seen, of course, several uh, uh, Wolfgang uh, theories that uh, uh, stated that the, uh, the concepts, the military and civilian concepts do differ from each other and they have different uh, objectives. Uh, but the last uh, factor uh, is uh, uh, focused uh, mainly on uh, uh, the uh, the state uh, and the concept of 1957 that, uh, uh, of course, uh, brought to light this uh, uh, this uh, dominance on the armed forces and the uh, military need. I think this friction and these tensions uh, have uh, emerged in 1957 and have been paramount in the Sudanese society. And we have seen like uh, the military violations, we have seen some more concepts and concepts uh, uh, emerging. We have like neutrality, military dependence. We have had some beliefs emerging also in the field uh, uh, and that uh, exacerbated the relations. We have also seen uh, that the equation of uh, this uh, voluntary dependence have been more pronounced because we have seen a majority of armed forces that proved to be professional and uh, has provided, to, uh, has uh, violated the civilian authority. And uh, this resulted in coups in Sudan. Uh, then uh, the concept or the theory of uh, military concept that Peter brought about and uh, it was mainly uh, focusing on a strong army or a robust army that it was at the service of the civilians and uh, this uh, exacerbated the situation of course we have seen that uh, the civilians uh, could not do what they wanted to do this uh, of course was a a very uh, specific topic that we had uh, to uh, handle during this period of time, uh, especially when uh, it's a question of armament and when the army is uh, acquiring arms and uh, uh, is uh, dominating. Uh, this uh, equation uh, was uh, taken into consideration and the question was as follows, how could a, uh, a situation with the government or with the, the people be uh, improved? So the, uh, the uh, of course, the dominance of civilians on the military institutions is considered to be the main factors in the civilian and military uh, relations. And despite the difference in the theories between the civilian and military, uh, especially concerning checks and balances, uh, we have seen that there were a kind there was a kind of agreement in this regard uh, uh, i think uh, it is the civilian uh, sovereignty was one of the major phenomenon that had to be taken into account what is common now in the views of a lot of research and literature is that where they concentrate on the relationships of the nation and the elected officials and all of the different kinds of military establishments and through this logic that sees in the official establishments the compass of the direction of all of the military and civilian uh, organizations to combine and to form a new relationship. One is that the uh, democratic relationships between military and civilian organizations, which uh, is led by uh, democratically elected officials, uh, even if they do differ in opinion The point is to work in cohesion, and uh, that does not also allow military to interfere in internal politics. But in this political form, this type of relationship actually is different in its form and the way it allows democracy to flourish in a country. So the core of this uh, uh, example is to distance military people away from the political decision making. And in the other way, to opposing, uh, on the opposite uh, side of that, is that the military uh, in, inter interfere, of course. Second uh, style 
is to have a politicized military where you can have political parties of the or the ruling class to have deep influence in the military. And this example, usually uh, where you have a revolutionary, for example, military, uh, where it could be a group or a, a political party uh, ruling. The th third is the Praetorian military uh, uh, and civilian uh, system where th uh, either one uh, affects and interferes in the other's uh, administration. Also, to determine the relationship between military and civilians is the core value of the traditional nature of the military. For in Sudan, for example, the Sudanese military has always played an, uh, uh, an extra role to what it was usually tasked with, uh, which usually should be to defend the, the and to um, uh, help uh, civilians in extraordinary conditions. This vision is that in a certain kind of chaos that might uh, you know, erupt in a kind of a, any kind of nation, where some nations have to actually rely on their internal resources, is that usually the last arrow in the uh, in, in the arsenal should be the military that should be ever used, not the first. And I think uh, the uh, important thing here is that the last uh, thing that a military should do is be the one in charge of internal security and politics. That is why I think think there should be certain uh, conditions in a nation to uh, hinder that kind of mingling and mixing where between lines of roles in these establishments that should, uh, for example, include the role of the military, sorry, the civilian uh, government to be the ones to draw the lines and boundaries of where these roles r really lie, and also to place proper laws and legislations within the framework of the Constitution to dictate all of this. And because the military and security apparatus, if they fall out of their traditional roles without the oversight of civilian governing, can be very threatening to the democracy of a nation. The fifth point, Dr. Luke, if I may, is the interference of outright military in the politics. And any kind of democratic rule uh, and government in a country. So the military uh, interference would be the most feared kind of system for them to come and play a political role. Military interference can be defined as that the military apparatus or a part of it can become a part of the political decision making in the direct uh, form by taking over the government and allowing the military uh, officers to uh, play a ruling role and make it a military government. And there's many examples throughout history, like the uh, like the guardians and the uh, uh, that became the uh, uh, system instead of the military, instead of the civilian, and uh, they become the ones who. Uh, uh, enforce any kind of uh, change. And the other one is the direct and full-blown military system to rule the, the country, which kind of comes from uh, any kind of military alliance. Alliance happens between uh, military uh, individuals and sections and some civilians who come hand in hand and a lot of coups happen and what happens is a lot of elitist kind of um, chosen sections and sectors from both sides kind of monopolize the role i could say that possibly for any government and with the leadership of civilians in sudan with good balanced relationships with the military can actually bring a lot of balance and stability to the sudan as long as they can actually commit to the constitution and agree, agreed upon points in the desire to come and bring uh, peace. And of course, with 
uh, agreement with a lot of the transitional also parties who want to bring a new and also to allow the national defense and security uh, apparatus in involvement and engagement with civil society together and to also uh, try to uh, 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 rely on a lot of the specialty councils uh, to bring better change to the nation. Thank you so much. General Imad for this uh, very valid um, If we could, we could ask you a last uh, question. If you could uh, give us a short answer, if we may. Do you think, do you believe, are you convinced that uh, when it comes to military leaderships and the responsibility of uh, pol politicians and civilians to bring under control the military establishment, how can this be come to be? I mean, this last question, what can the military leaderships do in a different way? to attract the uh, trust of the society, especially the youth, that there is uh, a desire uh, for democracy, especially when it comes to the current uh, civilian population, uh, but in a convincing manner. You've, you've touched upon them, but if you could actually make it a more condensed answer. Honestly, the first governments since our as a nation, which were parliamentary systems, with civil civilian uh, governments, uh, we had legislative and uh, executive. It shows at that time there was actually very good democratic uh, signs back then in the beginning, and that there was rule of the civilians over the military in a proper way. One could say that the the main factor is the is the civilian rule to have proper control over the military, but sometimes things happen conditions happen that are challenges and factors that can uh, affect the uh, trust between the military and the civilian uh, parts of the government and i think these uh, challenges are the big issue first cluster of types of issues is that what are the goals of the militaries that would make military people to have the desire to be decision makers and becoming uh, become a party a ruling party and i think there are opinions that sometimes economic and social conditions in society are the factors that pushes the military to have to take a certain role to salvage certain realities i think there are a number of uh, uh, realities i think which is the first thing is the definition of control is it a civilian control or is it a democratic control and how is it imposed this is a problem because i think the word control or taking control kind of uh, decreases the military side of understanding what their controlling and their supervision role is and what do we mean by what do we mean by m civilian uh, rule or control is it that they are the uh, elected bodies and also what is the discipline or the uh, 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 the, the, the the military's uh, position in falling under the civilian role is it absolute or is there uh, lines and borders and limits to that also that control and of course we have within the civilian uh, part of the government different levels from legislative to executive to uh, uh, to judicial and i think the most important thing is here is between the civilian rule which could be a political or democratic or civic and i think the most desired kind is the democratic form because it is the core that uh, is the uh, bloodline of the general uh, function of uh, uh, 
civil rule because what it is is that it, it will always fall back on the constitution with good free press and where it allows everything else to fall into place within it is the control and the management of the military apparatus i think it is possible to say that a civil government civilian government can manage the uh, transitional stage with cooperation with the military through the uh, full uh, adherence to the constitution and the Juba uh, Treaty for Peace, uh, which brings the solid agreement between the civilian and the military, which I think is the full um, uniformity between the military but i think the whole thing is needs way more details uh, especially when it comes to the specialty understanding of all of the factors and to understand that there are many standards that can help in bettering the relationship between the civilians and the military and that i think uh, needs a lot of effort to uh, empower the uh, relationships in this transitional stage. Thank you so much, General Imad, for this uh, very good uh, uh, presentation, because I think this can broaden the discussion uh, generally for all of us into delving into the civilian and the military. If we could move over to Ms. Mirvat uh, Hamdanil, and uh, General Ahmad, uh, when it comes to the the Constitution, and if we can delve into it, uh, Miss Mervet, if we may, depending on the, going back to your role that you've played on the constitutional document, which determined the relationship of the military and the civilian government, can you also please clarify how would you define uh, through the constitutional efforts uh, conducted? Thank you, Dr. Luca, and thank you to Africa Center for uh, bringing this wonderful uh, uh, conference together, which has been a wonderful uh, part of the effort to bringing democracy to Sudan and to develop the relationships between the different institutions, which were, uh, including the security institutions, of course. In the, in the Constitution, the point and the hope is that to, if we could, uh, through democracy, to transition to uh, uh, a government uh, that relies on the debate of the Constitution and, uh, uh, and uh, hold that the civilian government under the constitution to the uh, uh, to the beliefs of the revolutionary thought for society so i think the the, the constitution is uh, to, to transition towards a civilian government and hopefully to democracy and after that which that the civilian part of the government will have full control over the military and the security uh, effort. Also, in, in uh, Article number 5 says that the, uh, that the rule is for uh, the people, not the government. The people are the highest level of authority over everything, and that the, for, the power comes from the people. And, uh, and, and of course, this branches out into full clarification of what this is and what this means. And the government established through elections and democracy are the ones are the seat of power. In the in the council of of of, of rule and power, and the percentage and ratio of how many military, how many civilians, a uh, hold positions in this council. And another agreement came after that. is that the number is 13 and 14. And then the distribution uh, uh, of the role of the, uh, the uh, and the role and the level of the role between the civilian and the military. 
and hopefully the military will take its role which was determined and the civilian will also too in the council of uh, ministers the appointment of the two desks of the interior ministry and the defense is that for it to be also in a certain form and that they uh, bring forth a short list of names for people to be assigned as ministers and that the prime minister will uh, sign them and appoint them according to the constitution. When it comes to the parliament or the legislative body, is that the first three months, the, the transitional period of that body will also be put together and that uh, 70 67 percent will for the will be for the movement of the change and reform and the rest of the percentage will be uh, uh, representing the military kind of uh, and and uh, establishment uh, institution The bringing together the uh, hope of establishing peace has been assigned to the general ministries. And of course, this uh, in, 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 uh, guarantees the presence of uh, civilians in this crucial role in bringing together peace. And also, one of the biggest things here is to those who have been um, distanced and people who were taken away from their positions to be brought back and to give in back their rights in a balanced manner and in a neutral way in all organizations. And that is to uh, reconcile and to broaden the participation of all factors in society back into the government. This also actually has a great effect on the way the document is also uh, formed in the beginning. And this was on a balanced agreement, which was what was really uh, desired from the beginning, generally stemmed from trying to control the security and reality that we had. Uh, this is to be compared to what we really had when it came to security and the uh, military establishments that was in the previous government, which was undesired. And uh, what we had in the past, of course, and we're suffering from is the militias that were paralleling geographically and when it came to authority in different parts. This is a big crisis that cannot be accepted. That is why the transitional effort right now uh, is trying to work against that. This unstable situation is what has pushed certain bodies to have a better way to and to review and to reform the uh, even financial institutions and how to become better. And article number 12 is to reform the national to reform the uh, military establishments by military people who are in the know-how and know how to reform properly because the policies of reform It uh, has to be done in a way where they can actually do it, everything within the constitution for the goal. And, and to also reform and to rewrite uh, a lot of the legislations from the past that would always 
um, frame things correctly and properly and not leave things open for interpretation. And one of the biggest things is actually to do with social reform and involve women to in a higher percentage in all of these things going forward. I believe this would be a very strong The military in the past comprised a lot of the faces who are in the military councils. Mr. Imad remembers a lot of the faces and when There was also uh, also other members of those councils who had loyalties only absolute to uh, certain factors. And that is why it is very important for them not to have that role anymore and to distance them for the future. That is why I think when it comes to the relationship of the civilian and the military in the future is uh, not to allow any of these of the two to be penetrated by people who are more of a marginal and a more of a uh, limited uh, loyalty. That is why, why, uh, why we have to shy away from what we had in the past, which not allowed did not allow the military to be neutral. And as you know, this actually demolishes and destroys the military spirit and the institutions if it if it's molded in that incorrect way. Uh, and this is in regards to uh, the document that, uh, uh, the constitutional document that we're looking into. Thank you so much, Ms. Mirvat, for this clarifications and to, for the condensed uh, uh, effort on the, because of the short time, uh, the last question can be also, if I may, what can, civilians do differently to work with, with those security establishments to better and to uh, steer the whole operation into a more democratic form. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Pardon me? Yes, please. Yes. The civilians and the military have been faced uh, have faced the problem in committing to the details and the letter of the document of the constitution, and all of the shortcomings in it as a document actually represents uh, the effort where the transitional effort has to fix. But the thing is, this document has not been fully respected and abided by. So I think what is required is the civilians, if the civilians actually fully abide by and follow it, they will command a respect that anyone, everyone else will follow suit. And being that the... Uh, <laughs> Uh, after the massacre of the protest that happened, I believe that the relationships actually deteriorated and became even worse. Uh, and, and the thing is, I think the massacres that happened were the was the big push, but the relationships did not become better between the two sides. And it also culminated in that it showed that there was not a deep-rooted relationship between the military and the civilian also. The, uh, the the presidential council, of course, uh, which the ruling council, all being comprised of the two branches of the military and the civilian, uh, being of the traditional military and the security forces, is for them to practice this uh, their their authority under the authority of the civilian rule, if they can. Uh, uh, and for them, uh, 
but if they can practice their authorities in this form and the bodies governing in this council they can create a strong relationship between the civilians and the military who do believe in this transition to a better system that's a very important point this would m mold this relationship properly and i think the form of the relationship would be uh, that would be the foundation and a good point of trust between the military and the civilians i mean there are justifications on both sides for the interference of the military when they need to sometimes and the civilians also lacked in trying to use their power properly uh, in a, the correct manner and uh, mr imad did mention a good point when he said that the military and the uh, democratic logic might not meet and overlap but but the uh, force uh, form cannot be the solution for it sometimes even if there is a crisis and the thing about the democracy uh, journey is that it has to also start with trying to better and to reform the core belief of the military for what they aim for even if we take it from the security principle and philosophy we have to always coordinate with the military and through tanks and institutions to determine the actual role and to define the role of the military to in protection of the nation and the constitution so that uh, the governing uh, system cannot be turned into a chaos or a chaotic system. Uh, uh. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Mervid, very much for this clarification. I we would like to trans transit to Dr. Tamer. Of course, we have a military and a civilian background, and we need an academic voice here to shed some light onto what we have to compare between the two earlier speakers. Of course, you have uh, listened to Imad and to Mirvat. We heard Imad and Mirvat. What are the procedures and what are the to build this trust and to, of course, uh, handle this lack of trust between the military and the civilians, especially during this transition transitional period? Uh, we're talking here about the procedures in the Sovereign Council. Uh, Professor uh, Marvet, uh, Mervet focused on, uh, on uh, this uh, topic. Uh, excuse us, uh, we can't hear Dr. Luca. Thank you very much, Professor Luca. Thank you uh, to the United States Institute of Peace and uh, Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Uh, thank you all to all the participants. Good morning and uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening, wherever you are, ladies and gentlemen. The question uh, indeed is critical, especially in the scope of these series of webinars, and it contributes to the this peace building process, a building of, a, of a, the state and to realize the objectives of the transitional uh, phase. So we would like to thank you very much to uh, for handling this question and for covering this question. Thank you for this series of webinars. I would like to delve into the heart of the matter and say that building peace is one of the critical matters and the critical, uh, especially in the civilian and military uh, relations, because it uh, because it is really the heart at the core of this transitional phase in Sudan. Uh, it is a critical matter because if there is this, if there is no willingness, political willingness. Uh, 
uh, I think because it is uh, stated in the co uh, constitutional document, and this, re if there is no willingness, political citizens, no understanding of the civilian and military relations, uh, and if the spirit is not present, then it's hard to proceed. Before we we move forward, and before we talk about the peace building and the and the peace. Uh, spirit and this uh, uh, building of trust. Uh, I would like to talk about this uh, civilian and military relations because not only the not all the military are against the, 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 the transformation and the because there are some military sectors, especially in the middle class, who are uh, who are propelling and who are interested in this transitional phase. Uh, not all the civilians are automatically democratic democratic in their in their mindset. So we have uh, different sets of uh, civilians and uh, military. Uh, uh, now, when we talk about the, uh, of course, the uh, duality of, of the civilians and, and uh, military, uh, let's let's of course let's continue. Uh, and I would like to, uh, in our analysis, to differentiate between and categorize uh, the the civilians and military. One of the most important points to understand uh, this, uh, and one in order to to uh, of course to build and to increase and foster the spirit of trust, we have to think about the operation. When we think about this uh, this process, we have to think about the, the gaps that we have to, to bridge. We have to, to, to talk about the problems that have to be handled because there are several, several issues Issues. There are several stages. There are several processes. Uh, so, in the first phase, uh, uh, we have to understand what the process was in order to move to the second phase, and we have to understand the, the, the orientation, and and the and of course this democratic transition process. We have to have a good command of it, see what's going on, and we 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 have to have continuity, and we have to of course and understand uh, there are uh, people who talk about this uh, some people say that it's the last chance for sudan the, because there is there has been an accumulation of uh, processes uh, interventions and so on and so forth uh, so uh, we we really have to have good command of processes we we find ourselves uh, uh, you know in a situation where we don't have room for for mistake or so when when we think about the processes, uh, and in order to implement and, and, and realize its success, we have we have to ensure that the transitional period is handled correctly, and that and that of course uh, there are uh, there have to be reforms that have to be done at the civilian sector and so on and so forth. And the second point that I want to focus on is uh, the necessity uh, to uh, understand this Sudanese context, particularly uh, the heritage uh, that we have, uh, you know. The, the the processes that we have inherited through throughout time uh, when we look at the uh, the, the, the the previous regimes uh, since the independence of the sudan we have seen that the state has accompanied us in the process in, in uh, especially uh, during the last uh, phase and uh, we have seen uh, different processes taken up so the reform so to say is 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 a reform that should pertain to all of the apparatus of the state it should handle all of the sectors should cover all of the sectors uh, the state uh, has like a colonial uh, perspective so the uh, sudan sudanese states it's not the the ownership of uh, of, of sudanese states so we have this uh, heritage is uh, uh, is accompanying us and uh, we have people who are ruling at the detriment or at the expense of the of the uh, of the issues of the people we have um, we have for example uh, several issues uh, emerging and uh, so the uh, the mechanisms of the state and when we talk about the system the civilian system is uh, close to to the perspective of the people so when we talk about the civilian uh, for example security apparatus uh, we we have this question of terrorism that comes up and emerges and uh, we uh, we have uh, th this concept of the state is uh, is still needs to and to to be understood and to uh, and of course uh, to be understood fully uh, we need to understand in this perspective that uh, there is uh, there is this uh, the processes and it created uh, some feelings on the part of different uh, layers of the state it's like a uh, it's it's it is a 
a complicated process and this is why we had a different mechanisms uh, uh, coming out and emerging we have had different movements uh, coming up we have had different uh, for example this is a resistance movement that has uh, emerged and the these are all phenomena that require require specifically uh, the concept the concept that I have to protect myself from the state. Uh, so we have like a dis proportionate distribution of, of understanding. So the more we move towards the margin, we 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 do see a lot of uh, destructive uh, processes uh, happening. So we need this. Uh, uh, we're talking here uh, about the preservation of the national heritage. Uh, it's uh, when we talk about the uh, unity, we need to protect ourselves against coercion. We have to uh, realize this uh, concept of unity, which is of paramount importance. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, here we have uh, to uh, move uh, from the, uh, the the background. Uh, so and 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 we cannot unite ourselves with force. Uh, the the military, uh, I mean, uh, corp will not unite us. We have to unite ourselves uh, in in this general framework. And here we're talking about reform of the security sector of all sectors. So all of the sectors require uh, a major reform, and we have to look at this. Uh, seriously, uh, in, in order to uh, reform the security sector. Uh uh, we're talking about parties, we're talking about several sectors here, and uh, within this reform, we have to aim at uh, a general and uh, encompassing uh, perspective uh, whereby we make sure that uh, everything is uh, is is handled and managed. Uh, let me move to the second point, a uh, uh, second point pertaining to the importance of uh, what we call uh, the uh, opportunities and uh, as, and threats uh, before the pre-revolution, the revolution, and the post-revolution period. Uh, and uh, when we talk here about institutions, civilian and military institutions, and the civilian rule as a citizen. So one of the opportunities that we see uh, here when we look at the uh, existing threats and and uh, and challenges the greatest opportunities is that uh, is that the uh, the revolution in sudan presented us with uh, with several concepts uh, you know peace justice and security uh, there is this awareness people awareness it is the major guarantee the awareness of people is the major guarantee for success it is one of the major guarantee in sudan so we're talking about awareness the awareness is a critical issue uh, the uh, so we need that uh, citizen awareness in order to reach a peace building process. We have to take advantage of golden opportunities presented to us, and we need to make sure that we are able to present and, and to preserve the objective of the revolution. Um, and we have to, uh, you know, take that force, the revolution force, into account. Uh, second, the, the, the constitutional document, as Miss uh, Miss Mervet had. Uh, Adina stated, uh, you know, determines the relation between civilians and uh, military, and it uh, focuses on uh, on the components of this uh, relationship, uh, uh, it it opens or paves the way for opportunities uh, to uh, rule civilian and military rule to continue in this in this uh, peace. Building process, uh, trust, uh, as, as we, this uh, constitutional document stipulates and, and and focuses on on this opportunity, uh, an opportunity for visions. Uh, the visions may be may be different, but they can be ironed out. The, the visions can be ironed out. It's uh, also threatened by the economic existing condition. Uh, so the economic situation is uh, is is in the, in the lack of prosperity. So sometimes uh, we see ourselves that uh, we tend to blame the government or the the civilian uh, government and civilian rule and uh, we we uh, so i think it ha there has to be there is some competition between uh, the the, the two but I, I will talk about the opportunities and also about the existing challenges the revolution paved the way as well uh, for uh, for for existing mechanisms uh, uh, for example transitional justice uh, mechanism of uh, transitional justice uh, uh, and it paved the way for a new uh, for a new beginning uh, and so so through the transitional justice uh, process, 
uh, we see that, uh, for example, oppression could be uh, could be wiped out, and uh, and uh, and this trust uh, has two sides. Is is it? Uh, uh, and Mr. Uh, Ahmed has talked about monopoly of violence and has talked also uh, about uh, the uh, this monopoly of violence. It has to be uh, accompanied by another process. We need to have, thanks to it, uh, a, um, a, a, a systems that are governed by uh, by a rule. So the implementation of 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 uh, of, of course uh, of the of of uh, the the rule or of uh, and and I think it's an opportunity for people to protect themselves and it's an opportunity for people to understand through this process of uh, justice that uh, uh, that the situation can be improved. Uh, we have said that this transitional justice is a tool. One of the uh, threats or one of the challenges uh, that I see is that the process is very slow and that there is a lack of uh, uh, of uh, of uh, there is this frustration and uh, there is this uh, distrust building. Uh, we see that, uh, for example, sometimes justice is not uh, implemented and people, the citizens feel uh, that uh, uh, they feel that there is this lack of trust. Number four, uh, the, um, of course, uh, security um, uh, forces is one of the sees itself as a par partner in this revolution and it's committed to its objectives it's 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 a good vision we are all partners in this uh, process uh, uh, and it, it is uh, of course uh, th there are so many analyses in this regard and uh, uh, we see that there are uh, leadership that was uh, following the old the old regimes and they were try trying to preserve their interests and uh, and 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 they joined the, the revolution and it, and and there and we see that there are there is change but i think that they need to uh, prove themselves and to and and to focus on these on these uh, questions uh, more particularly so one of the things is that is of the uh, suppression system has has it changed properly or uh, uh, from the things that we were saw in the past, but the thing, but the point after that is that if we could talk about the uh, redirection of resources properly, because it's another point of trying to reinforce um, uh, trust. You have to understand it was a it was a, it was a war based nation, and all of its economy and its resources was directed towards a war effort. The thing is, can a redirection of national resources and wealth be redirected, reformed in a way, for you know uh, infrastructure? And of course, you have to understand that the security of a nation is goes hand in hand with development and healthy nation, healthy economy. And that's one of the things I think that could make people, make the society, that they feel deeply that there is a positive and there is reasons for them to rebuild and to allow trust. So it's a long process. We have to be patient, but the patience is has comes from a desire that you are convinced that there is a right path but if you know if you're on the right path even if mistakes happen people will not uh, lift their hands so if i make make a few very quick points if i may there is if there is a global support even if it's a theor theoretic i mean i mean if it's the eu or the united nations the united nation states i think at least when it comes to, if, even if it's just rhetoric, that they do allow and help for the democratic uh, uh, transition to happen. But I think there are also regional forces that can actually be, play a negative role if they were to interfere in a nation. Uh, not, not all dimensions and views are homogeneous or on the same path. One of the things also is that the, is the oppressive style uh, uh, of the transitional government has gone down. That's a positive thing, of course. But I think the oppressive style can still open uh, uh, a dialogue on the strategic because when it comes to dialogue, you have to understand it means participation. Participation is the core thing about dialogue. So when you don't allow that, so I think one of the core things is to the ownership uh, 
so I, I think the security reform and the allowing of certain kind of freedoms is a like a, the last point, if I may, when it comes to the uh, future uh, uh, peace agreements, that it be up an opportunity to correct some of the things that we know now are uh, uh, not well and have shortcomings and to also take the right correct first steps to establish a one for all uh, uniformed military which represents everyone and it's for all i mean when you take the definitions taken from the military establishments and security is that what what is the definition of the military establishment uh, when it comes to the military apparatus means the armed forces of this of sudan and the quick response teams so so what what is the definition of the quick response teams are they military are they not military so the definition can be slightly vague here so i think uh, the definition and what their stance is the in legality what they are so it has to be really spelled out clearly has to be defined properly so that there can be a proper but there are many mechanisms and that are suggested like the uh, constitutional uh, congress and the point of it all is to develop and evolve healthy relationships it's not anyone to control we are all partners that's the goal thank you so much thank you dr tamer for the clarification especially the uh, not to the <laughs> generalized and also some um, opportunities and the styles and how to strengthen the relationship between the military and the civilian.